Is everyone, is my uh, PowerPoint coming up, Brittany? Yep. It is. And You're are those boxes there? Should I do the control alt shift thingy? Or is it clear? I do not see any boxes right now. You're good to go. Okay. Sounds good. Then I will get started here. So, um, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, my name is Erin Dorsett, um, and I am, as Brittany said, uh, part of the Wetlands Monitoring Assessment Program within DENREC. And I'll start us off today uh, by talking about different coastal habitats that you're likely to encounter um, when you're constructing or designing a living shoreline project. So, We'll start the discussion by talking about why it's important to understand habitats. And really, habitats um, play a really important role in pretty much every step of the way in a living shoreline project. So it's important to understand your habitat when you're trying to define and describe different types of habitat zones during site evaluation. So next week in the workshop, when you start talking about how to properly evaluate a site to see if it's appropriate for a living shoreline, um, you'll see a lot of these terms and concepts pop up in that document. So it's important to understand just so you can put into meaningful words what you're seeing at the site. Um, it's also really helpful to clarify your project justification. So it's always important to have a good reason for why you're doing the project, whether it be for applying for funding source or applying for permits, things like that. Um, just the reason why you're doing the project and understanding your habitat can really help with that. So, for example, um, maybe just describing what types of wildlife you're helping um, by enhancing a habitat or maybe what types of structures or um, habitats you're protecting with your, your living shoreline. Um, and, and understanding habitats is also extremely important when you're talking about the design of your living shoreline because it really informs what materials you're going to use, how you're going to place those materials on the shoreline, as well as what plant species are appropriate in that area. Um, understanding your habitat is also helpful when you're trying to complete your permit application. So, for example, uh, by understanding the types of wildlife that might use your habitat um, at your project site you might better understand what potential time of year restrictions might apply to you. And finally, uh, understanding your habitat can really help inform your adaptive management and troubleshooting efforts. So if something doesn't look quite right after you construct your project, um, knowing what your habitat should look like compared to what it does look like can help you identify a problem more quickly and help you solve it more effectively. So, all of the terms and concepts that I'm going to talk about today, you're going to see popping up in um, today's presentations, but also next week's presentations when you start talking about uh, things like design and planning. So it might be review for some people. For some people, it might be new information. Like I said, we're going to talk about um, the, most habit the most common habitat types um, that you'll encounter when you're constructing or evaluating sites for living shorelines. And these include uh, different types of tidal wetlands, such as salt brackish and tidal freshwater marshes, as well as beach and dune habitats. So we'll kick things off with our tidal wetlands. Tidal wetlands, just like any other vegetated wetland, contain three main characteristics, including hydrology, meaning that they're wet for at least part of the year, um, at or just below the surface. And in the case of tidal wetlands, they are very wet. <laughs> um, they have hydric soils, meaning that the soils are saturated long enough in the growing season for anaerobic conditions to occur, which means that the soils have very little oxygen in them because they're so wet. And they have hydrophytic vegetation, meaning that the plants are tolerant of very wet conditions. So there's a lot of different types of wetlands, of course. Um, you know, there's tidal swamps, but we're talking mostly about tidal marshes here. Um, and marshes really are wetlands that have herbaceous emergent vegetation. And all that means is that the plants tend to grow above water, and they're mostly non-woody plants. So things like grasses, sedges, rushes, 
And tidal marshes in particular are those marshes that experience changing water levels that are linked to ocean tides. Um, they have very wet, mucky soils because of the fact that parts of them are, are flooded every single day with the tides. Um, and because of that, they have a very slow decomposition rate, meaning there's a lot of organic material that builds up. And you often smell a very sulfur smell or like rotting eggs when you're out there, very typical of tidal marshes. And because it's so wet, these plants that are growing there are very well adapted to living in waterlogged soils with very little oxygen. So one cool thing about tidal marshes is that they're very dynamic systems. They're constantly changing and they have the capability naturally to maintain their size and elevation or even grow in size and elevation. And how they do that, um, is, is shown on this diagram. There's a lot of different factors that play into things. So for example, when um, water comes in and moves across the marsh plants, the marsh plants help to slow that water down, allowing sediment to drop out of the water column and build up the marsh surface. And also because there is um, high primary productivity on these marshes, there's a lot of plant growth and then coupled with the slow decomposition rate, you have a lot of organic material buildup. So marshes have that ability to, to um, grow or maintain. But if there's a lot of erosion happening from things like excessive boat wakes or a lot of coastal storms or even things like sea level rise, um, you also have the potential for land subsidence occurring underneath the marsh, all of those factors can um, contribute to marsh erosion um, or the sinking of a marsh. So very dynamic systems, a lot of factors that play into what's going on with the marsh. And typically in terms of living shorelines, it's very common to see erosion at your site because um, a lot of times that's one of the purposes of a living shoreline. So tidal marshes occur naturally along different salinity gradients. And the estuarine marshes include salt and brackish marshes, where salt marshes are the saltiest. They are closest to the ocean. Brackish marshes are a little bit further upstream, and that's where freshwater and saltwater mix. And then if you go even further inland, you'll hit um, tidal palustrine or tidal freshwater wetlands, which are the wetlands that are just close enough to the ocean to still experience tides but far enough away where the water is fresh. If you go any further inland, you'll end up hitting non-tidal freshwater wetlands. And we're not really gonna talk about non-tidal wetlands today because in terms of living shorelines, you're mostly gonna be dealing with tidal wetlands. Um, the reason that we split up these wetlands based on salinity is because salinity is a really important factor that dictates the plant and animal communities that live in these marshes and cause these marshes to look pretty different from one another. So we'll start by talking about salt and brackish marshes, which I've combined for the sake of time in this presentation because they do have a lot of similarities. Um, one of the main differences, as I just mentioned, is that salt marshes are a little bit saltier, um, where the salinity of the water tends to be at 18 parts per thousand or more, whereas brackish marshes can range widely from 0.5 to 18 parts per thousand. And salt and brackish marshes, parts of those marshes are inundated by water every single day when the tide is high. Um, the plants that live there are very tolerant of flooding and salt water. And there are very distinctive zones of plants and tidal inundation based on the elevation within the marsh. Um, there tends to be low plant diversity compared with tidal freshwater marshes because the salt water in these marshes create um, a much more harsh environment. So there's a lot fewer plants that are adapted to live there. So as I just said, uh, habitat zonation um, occurs in these marshes. And as you can see in this diagram, they occur on an elevation gradient where on the left side of the diagram, you see the lower elevation areas and moving to the right, you go all the way to the uplands, the higher elevation areas. 
So the elevation of these different areas means that different zones within the marsh are inundated with tides at different frequencies. And because of that, you see different plants growing there and different animals using those areas. You can also see um, denoted on this diagram where mean low water, mean high water, and then the higher spring or extreme storm tides tend to hit within those zones. So I'm gonna break down each one of these habitat zones in a little bit more detail. Starting with the lowest elevation um, of the habitat zones is the subtidal area. So this area is not really with, it wouldn't really be within your project site most likely. Um, it would sort of be adjacent it's that habitat that's underwater all the time at high and low tide, it is submerged. And uh, you may or may not find vegetation in that subtidal area. Um, if it's not vegetated, it'll just be plain sand or mud. But if you do have vegetation there, we call that submerged aquatic vegetation or SAV. And that is great habitat for fish and shellfish and it's also great for your water quality. So keep a lookout for SAV. Um, if you have it there, that's a good thing and you want it to stick around. So in Delaware, we only have two species of SAV that occur in saltwater areas, the, those being eelgrass and wooden grass. Um, we have some of them in the inland bays. We do have a small struggling um, eelgrass bed, so hopefully we can get that back going. Um, and also a growing population of widgeon grass. Um, if you're looking at a site near the Delaware Bay, you're probably not going to see SAV because the Delaware Bay is naturally very turbid, meaning there are a lot of suspended sediments, and that really limits SAV growth because SAV strongly relies on clear water for the sunlight to penetrate. Um, SAV is a little bit more plentiful though if you're working in the Chesapeake Bay or the Maryland and Virginia coastal bays. Moving a little bit up in elevation is the mudflat habitat zone, which is flooded at high tide, but it is exposed at low tide. So it's just higher in elevation um, than the submerged area that it is exposed to the air at low tide, but it's low enough in elevation and it's wet enough that it still can't really support vegetation. You won't always see a mudflat because mudflats typically only occur in lower energy environments or in areas where there is a pretty shallow slope between the wetland and, um, and the water. But they're really important habitats where they do occur because they're home to a lot of different invertebrates that um, create important ha foraging habitat for birds. Here is a picture of a lovely mudflat. Um, you can see how wet it is, and that really suggests that it was very recently flooded when the tide was higher. You can see that the tide is low in this photo, the mud is exposed to the air, and you can also tell that there is no green living vegetation on that mud flat because it's just too wet, it's just low enough in elevation. But if you move slightly upward in elevation to a new habitat zone called the low marsh, this is still intertidal, just like mudflats, where it's regularly flooded at high tide and not so much at low tide, but it is high enough in elevation that it can support plant life. And the main plant you're gonna see in a low marsh is salt marsh cordgrass, which is Bartina alterniflora. If you're in a brackish marsh, especially some with like lower salinity, you might also see big salt marsh cordgrass or Bartina sinoceroides, but the main one that people tend to think about with a low marsh is Bartina alterniflora. Some of the features you might see within low marshes include natural tidal creeks, which are really windy, um, and or you might see man-made ditches, which are e easily distinguishable from natural creeks because of how straight and dug out they look. Um, not always, but sometimes you might see hummocks and hollows, and you'll know you have hummocks and hollows if you're walking around in the site and you feel like you are hopping on islands. So hummocks are these higher vegetated spots that are easier to walk on, whereas the hollows are lower and very soft and soupy areas. 
Um, the creeks that are in these marshes are used by fish and invertebrates, and the creeks in the marsh are also used by many birds like herons, egrets, and rails. Here's a photo of a low marsh. You can see that the tidal creek, um, the tide is low in this photo. Um, you can see those exposed muddy banks of that creek. You can also tell there's only one plant species growing there, that is Spartina alterniflora. And you can also see that there's plain evidence of tidal flooding where there's mud staining on the Spartina right next to the tidal creek. This is not an all-inclusive list, but just a few uh, common low marsh and mudflat wildlife you might see out there. Um, different species of birds like clapper rails or sandpipers, many types of um, you know, invertebrates. You've got blue crabs, fiddler crabs, ribbed mussels, and then also some small estuarine fish that are you know, using those tidal channels like mummachogs. And some of those are on this list, but a few others that I didn't mention yet, things like egrets and herons, you might see diamond, diamondback terrapins around, other types of fish like killifish or silver sides, and some other invertebrates like mud snails or marsh periwinkles. Still higher in elevation is the high marsh, as the name suggests. Um, it is higher in elevation than the low marsh, such that it is not, does not tend to be flooded every single day. It's usually only flooded at extreme tides or storms. Um, and because there's less flooding, that allows for a little bit more plant diversity. So some of the plants you might see in a high marsh include glasswort, sea lavender, salt meadow cordgrass, or spiked salt grass, as well as some of the other ones I've listed. And you might still see some creeks or ditches extending up into the high marsh. But some of the other features you might see within a high marsh are things like salt pans or pools. So salt pans are shallow depressions that can pool water, um, but during drier spells, they tend to dry out. And when they dry out, the salt gets very, very concentrated there. Um, and because of how salty it is, there's really little to no vegetation able to grow there, with the exception of maybe a little bit of Salicornia species or maybe certain species of algae. And then pools are similar to pans, except they're a little bit deeper and they're usually filled with water. And because they're usually filled with water, there might even be some small fish living in there. So here's a visual of some pools within a salt marsh. And then in contrast, here's an unvegetated pan. You can see it's recently dried out. There's very little vegetation growing in there and there is some algae starting to grow in there. Um, high marsh wildlife, I figured I would mention a couple of these obligate species um, that utilize high marsh habitat for nesting, those being salt marsh sparrows and seaside sparrows. And it's just important to be aware that, that birds like this use high marsh habitat because their nests are within the grasses. They're very challenging to see. So um, it's also important because high marsh habitat is very vulnerable to things like sea level rise. So if you see high marsh habitat at or near your site, just be aware that it's a really important habitat for some species like this that only nest in high marsh areas. They really need that. Um, there's also an area that tends to be on the upper edge of the high marsh, sort of between the high marsh and the upland. We call this sort of a transition area that's definitely irregularly flooded from coastal storms. Up there, you might start to see some shrubs like marsh elder or groundsel bush that are still tolerant of salt spray. But the main thing I wanted to touch on talking about this area is that it's frequently invaded by non-native invasive European reed known as Phragmites australis. You can see in this picture the native high marsh species, Spartina, species uh, Spartina petens is right there. And between that and the upland forest is a band of that Phragmites. Just a couple quick words about Phragmites because it is very widespread in Delaware and also throughout the Mid-Atlantic. It is an invasive plant, very common. It expands rapidly and crowds out your native marsh species that you want. Um, and it's capable of growing from seeds or rhizomes. 
It tends to be the most successful at establishing in fresher or low salinity brackish marshes where there's um, fresh water and also spots where there's not too much flooding, which is why you tend to see it on the upper edge of high marshes. However, when stands have established and matured, they can start to withstand higher salinities and higher flooding frequencies, and you could start to see uh, the Phragmites expanding once it's more mature. You do not want Phragmites because um, it really degrades uh, habitat quality, but also when you're, when you're constructing a living shoreline project, you are inherently disturbing the area that you're in, and Phragmites loves disturbed areas meaning that living shoreline sites are prime candidates for Phragmites invasion. And it's really hard to get rid of it once it's there. So as you can see on the diagram to the left, Phragmites is capable of altering marsh elevation as well as marsh hydrology um, much, more, much more differently than native species would because they can build the marsh surface up more quickly through enhanced sediment accretion and high organic matter deposition. And they can also fill in tidal creeks um, pretty quickly over time. And all of those things degrade habitat quality for wildlife that depend on natives and on unaltered hydrology. Shifting gears a little bit, we won't talk too much about tidal freshwater marshes because you're probably gonna be working mostly in salt or uh, brackish marshes in terms of living shorelines but a couple of quick things about tidal fresh marshes. Um, they, as I've said, are mostly fresh water, but they are still influenced by the tide. One thing though, is that they often do not have as the, the habitat zonation that is as visually obvious as in um, brackish and salt marshes. There does tend to be a lot higher plant diversity because the plants don't have that salt water to contend with. So you'll notice in tidal freshwater marshes that there really is no spartine alterniflora growing. But it is important to be aware that invasive Phragmites can be an even bigger problem in these areas because it's fresher water and they like that. It likes that. Um, marsh, freshwater marshes are much softer and more soupy than salt and brackish marshes, so um, they tend to be much more difficult to walk around in as well. Quick note about SAV that could be in subtidal habitat that's adjacent to tidal freshwater marshes. There is, um, there is, are SAV species in Delaware um, for freshwater. There's actually, I believe, 20 or 30 something different species. Some are invasive, but a lot of them are native. Um, and here's just a couple of examples of SAV you might see adjacent to tidal freshwater areas. There are a lot of different plants you might see out in these areas. Um, here I've listed some of the common ones in Delaware, um, including pickerel weed, arrow arum, various smart weeds or cattails, things like that. Um, but again, that's not an all-inclusive list. There's a lot of plant diversity. And just to show you an example of how high that plant diversity can be, this was actually a field site that our wetland program was at just a few summers ago. And you can see how, in contrast to that low marsh area I showed you earlier with just one plant species, here in just one shot, you can see five or six different plant species. And also, I threw this picture in just to show you how soupy the sediments are. You can tell just by looking at it that if you tried to walk in there, it would be pretty challenging. There aren't really any species that are obligate tidal freshwater marsh species. So the wildlife that tend to use these areas can also be found in brackish marshes or non-tidal marshes. But a few of the common ones you might see are things like marsh wrens, red-winged blackbirds, herons, muskrats. You might even see otters um, swimming around in there as well. So that's pretty much it for um, tidal freshwater, freshwater marsh, and we'll shift, we'll shift gears um, for this last part um, just to talk about beaches and dunes, another common habitat type um, for living shoreline sites. So these are the sandy habitats along coastlines, and just like uh, salt and brackish marshes, they have really distinctive um, habitat zones that are visually obvious. 
These habitats tend to move landward over time as onshore winds blow sand away from the water towards inland. And the plants that live in these dune habitats are really specialized and help stabilize the dunes. Um, and they're so specialized because the conditions are really intense. Um, they have to deal with things like salt spray, high temperatures and desiccation, wind, sand, and low nutrient levels. Just like tidal marshes, beaches and dunes are very dynamic systems. So you can see on this diagram um, all of the different ways that wind and water can move sediment along the shore or towards the inland. So, you know, beaches are constantly um, in a cycle of erosion and accretion. And as I said, they tend to exhibit um, some pretty obvious habitat zonation, just like salt and brackish marshes. Um, I like this diagram from, it was made by Denrec and Delaware Sea Grant. Um, and I will go into each of these in a little bit more detail. That way you can also see uh, the, the text of those plants a little bit better. But moving from left to right here, uh, the left-hand side is closest to the ocean where the beach and the fore dune is. And as you move to the right, you move further inland away from that shoreline towards um, more mature dunes as well as maritime forest. So we'll start closest to the ocean and the shoreline with the beach and the fore dune. So beaches, as many of you know just from being at the beach, um, you know, the beaches, Parts of the beach are intertidal, meaning that more of the beach is covered at high tide, more of it's exposed at low tide, and those areas are usually devoid of plants. But you can usually tell based on where the rack line is on the beach where the normal high tide line hits, and that rack is a bunch of usually deposited um, plant material. And above that normal high tide line is where you might start to see some plant growth um, happening extending up into the fore dune. So the fore dune is the youngest dune in the system. Um, remember that wind tends to be blown from that shoreline towards the inland. Um, so the fore dune is the youngest and it is also the most intense in terms of conditions because being closest to the water, it receives a lot of wind, salt spray, blowing sand. So because of those intense conditions, the plants that are able to grow there are very well adapted to those conditions. So they're really low growing to try to reduce the effects of the wind. They also can establish quickly. They can um, have high growth rates and strong root systems to really establish themselves there. And once they're established, um, they help hold the dune together by holding that sediment in place. Moving a little bit further away from that shoreline towards the inland, these are the back dunes that are a little bit older and more well established than the fore dunes. They still do experience some salt spray and wind, um, but it's a little bit more sheltered compared with the beach and the fore dune. And because of that, um, you might see some taller plants starting to grow and maybe even some woody plants. And I've listed just a handful of common plants you might find um, on the left there. Interdunal swales, you're not always going to see these, but I figured I would mention them because they are a unique wetland type in Delaware. They occur in these low pockets between dunes. And it's really interesting because they're actually freshwater wetlands that are fed mainly by groundwater and precipitation. So even though they're so close to the ocean and might still experience some salt spray and maybe even occasionally some storm surge, they are freshwater systems. Um, so really unique wetland type to be aware of. Here's a photo of one. You can see that on either side of it are some sandy dunes with some vegetation growing on them, but then um, it's really densely vegetated in that low interdunal wet swale in the middle of those two dunes. Moving even further inland is the secondary dune maritime forest area. And this is where you really start to see woody plants beginning to grow because it is stable enough and far away enough from all of those um, harsher conditions closer to the shoreline that those woody plants can start to colonize. Um, plant communities can be very different in these areas depending on 
what your groundwater levels are like, um, but I have listed it some of the common plants um, that you might see in these areas. And it is worth noting that you're not always going to see a secondary dune or a maritime forest. Um, these are really only present in mature areas that do not have a lot of human disturbance. So in younger systems or unstable systems, you might only have a beach or you might only have a beach in a four dune. Um, same applies for if you have um, a lot of human development going right up to um, your shoreline that does not allow for these more complex systems. And so um, these are really only in areas that there's little human disturbance and they're stable enough where, where these, these can form. These are just a few unique uh, wildlife, things like leaf turns and piping clovers use these areas to nest. You can also see things like horseshoe crabs and ghost crabs along these areas. Um, you might also see things like diamondback terrapins nesting in these sandy areas, and lots of gulls and other shorebirds like to hang out there too. With that, I'm wrapping things up. Um, just a couple of quick slides at the end here for additional habitat resources. A couple of these Brittany already mentioned, and some of them are on your agenda already. Um, things about different plants, as well as a list of invasive plant species, and some more wetland type information. And then I also included a couple of links um, if you want to look at habitat mapping because using GIS can be really helpful to characterize your habitat as an initial guide before you actually visit your habitat in the field. So with that, I am all finished. All right. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you fine. Okay, all right. So uh, I'm Bart Wilson, I'm project manager for the Coastal Delaware Refuge Complex, so Bombay Hook and Prime Hook National Wildlife Refuges. Um, I'm a geologist by training. I do a lot of work with uh, restoration, uh, coastal restoration projects at the refuges and also regionally uh, working on projects in basically from Virginia up to Rhode Island, um, doing all kinds of facets of it. but. What I'm going to be focusing in on today is uh, plants and seeding um, from coastal restoration perspective, because um, I've been doing quite a bit of this. So it's what I'm going to become a, uh, presenting on is more of um, the applied aspects of this, where um, there's some science, but also it's some things to kind of consider when you're actually doing these, from how you kind of uh, go about, you know, installing plants and seeding. So uh, some major considerations, some of it was kind of already mentioned. Um, I think when you're going into restoration projects, uh, you know, and again, it can be anything from really living shorelines to, um, you know, marsh creation, uh, thin layer projects. A lot of these things are going to kind of be considerations for all of them that, you know, I think you want to have a good uh, sense of your project goals. Um, and that can be from, you know, you're doing a living shoreline project where um, it was really just stabilizing the edge and you're going to do a, a you know a passive means of capturing sediment and if you do something like that maybe you're going to let vegetation naturally recolonize through you know seeds floating in versus a project where you're really kind of building out the marsh where you may have to go in and know that okay and if especially if you're like you're using sand um, then you're going to have to go in and plant things. So those are some of the things you want to kind of have in mind. And again, environmental conditions, as was kind of already mentioned, you know, elevation, salinity are really going to be uh, dictate kind of, you know, what kind of plants and how you're going to plant them. You know, installation methods that will go through uh, invasive control is going to be a big one. And uh, predators is another one when we consider uh, vegetation planting. So project goals. So again, Scale of the project is a key consideration where if you're doing a massive project um, where, you know, uh, you could be doing a mile <laughs> of shoreline stabilization, you may not want to plant your uh, plants, uh, you know, 24 inches on center um, just because of cost. You may be thinking of, hey, let's plant them 48 inches on center. Um, reduce the cost and depending on what type of plant you're using, if you're using alternate flora, 
within, uh, you know, the next growing season through rhizomal activity could be, really fill that in. So scale of the project really um, comes is a, is a key part of that. And that comes with like the rate of recovery where, you know, with a lot of these living shorelines, if you want to um, have a nice uh, stabilized area through vegetation, you know, you may be reducing your spacing. But if it's an area where it's, you know, it's um, the amount of wave activity and erosion is really dictated um, by, you know, wake, boat wake, things like that. Maybe you do the spacing a little further apart to kind of save on cost or just because your project area is so big. Um, you know, I think methods of planting is a key consideration as well, where, um, you know, again, plants versus seeds, which we'll talk a little bit more about. You know, prepping the site before construction. There's a lot of different things for, um, you know, one, one of the key considerations, especially living shoreline projects um, and the coastal setting, as was mentioned, Phragmites is a, a huge issue. Some of these sites, before you even start to construct, um, you may want to go in there and do intensive Phragmites control and reed removal to kind of help prepare the site. Um, that would really make it a little bit easier for yourself. You know, um, materials used for restoration, that is a, a key thing I can't hit on enough that uh, sand versus mud are gonna be distinctly different in how you can do things. Um, if you're backfilling with sand, you know, you're gonna have to plant, um, uh, you know, you're gonna have to plant actual plants, you know, um, if it's sand, you're not going to be able to seed. You're not going to get the, the soil contact that you need for germination and seeds unless you um, heal it in with a cold pack or something like that, which I'll show an example of. Um, while mud, you know, you can plant plugs in, but you just, depending on how soupy the material is, you know, you have to worry about stability or them getting kind of uh, washed out. But one of the things that you can do in very muddy conditions is you can use seeding, uh, especially for uh, surface seeding where you just disperse it on the surface and it'll here and get good sediment contact. So those are some of the issues. Uh, geochemical issues, um, you know, when you're using fine grain material, you may be more likely to get um, acid uh, formation, uh, sulfate reduction. So that may uh, cause stunting of the plants or dieback. So these are some of the things that as you're planting, if you start seeing one or two seasons out, some of the, uh, you know, health of the plants or the vigor starts to go down, maybe these are some of the things you should start thinking about. Uh, a common one is they call sophomore slump in uh, large scale, especially when you're doing a lot of a thick layering of mud. Um, sometimes in the second growing season, um, the alterniflora and patents will suffer in their vigor. Um, but usually by the third year, it comes back because the first year they have all these fresh nutrients and they take off and the second year kind of really stabilizes you have some geochemical issues it needs to kind of um, kind of stabilize with and then it kind of takes off one thing i'll show an example of is design versus as built this is a huge consideration you know you have a design and then when you actually build it um, it looks completely different so you have to be able to kind of adapt your planting strategy accordingly both elevation distribution of plants things like that um, you know, I think building in multiple benefits of your project is a key thing as well, where, um, you know, Brian's going to be talking a little bit about habitat benefits. I think I can't impress upon that enough, where sometimes it's easy to just say, hey, we'll just put one or two species of plants in an area and that's it. Um, I like to kind of say, well, let's push the envelope and create zonations, create that diversity, even though it's a little bit lower in salty settings, you can uh, install some other plants, especially at the upper ends of your growth range, to build in diversity, especially for uh, pollinator species. Um, I really love trying to incorporate those types of things, and especially for, you know, uh, a lot of the birds that um, really are marsh dependent. Uh, uh, another thing to kind of talk to yourself about is this project evolving with the landscape. So, are you in an area that's um, through sea level rise going to transgress? You know, um, I think that's a consideration for how you build it with materials, but also planting. And, you know, as you're going into it, if you're thinking about 
this site transgressing over time, you know, take a hard look at the slopes that you're building into it or having to contour. Um, I think that'll be a key consideration when you're doing this, and especially for um, the vegetation you're putting in as well. And are you trapping sediment? Um, you know, again, in Delaware, most of our areas are non deltaic, so fine grained sediment is not the primary way of vertical accretion of these areas. It's mainly through bio, below ground biomass, so plants putting uh, roots in the ground to build the, from the from the bottom up. But sediment is an important factor. So if you have a lot of uh, fine grained muddy sediments, um, you know, kind of thinking about trapping that sediment, it can be a consideration for helping to kind of jumpstart the elevation of these areas. So how how densely do you plant your plants, things like that. So um, some of the examples I'm going to show to you guys uh, range in their scale quite a bit. But I, as I said, I think sometimes scaling of a project doesn't necessarily matter per se. Some of the fundamental principles are the same. It's just how you implement them and the volume of the work you need. So here's an example of a shoreline project we did at Prime Hook. Um, it's about uh, 9,000 linear feet total length. It was building a beach and then building a huge big back barrier platform. And what I'm going to center on is the big back barrier platform, which is, you know, this area back here, um, if everyone can see my cursor, this area back here, where um, kind of to the south. And what we were going to do is have a big uh, kind of back barrier area and then do plantings of patents and uh, alternate flora, so low marsh, high marsh, super tidal marsh. And this was kind of the design that went into it before we started doing the project. So, you know, we were going to have about 35 areas of kind of back dune where we are going to plant Panicum amarum, Panicum verganum, and then, you know, about eight acres of patens and nine acres of alterna flora. So this is what we went into it. So we were all excited. We had our planting plan, everything spacing. It was going to be great. But... Um, so here's a, a layout of how the project actually turned out. So the yellow line is what was planned. The green line is what was built. And that's just aerial extent. Um, the elevations were a lot different as well. So again, if you are very stuck on a specific design with your going into it, you may have trouble because your, you know, your post construction as built may be considerably different. So it's almost like you want to have a design going into it that um, you know, kind of fundamentally covers everything, elevation, spatial distribution, planting distance, but some of that you would really want to be able to kind of, um, you know, be able to kind of uh, change it on the fly and how you implement it on the ground. You know, so this is actually what the planting plan ended up looking like. Before it was very linear in, in kind of vertical zonation, and this you know, the area that has the red dots is all patents, and the area with like the red stripes is all alternate flora, because some of the slopes, once where the sand hit the water, was a little too steep, and it just wasn't worth putting in pay, uh, the alternate flora. So this is kind of where we really adapted. And again, our plan was spatially, you know, okay, hey, we're going to do this area, um, you know, this way. But we were able to kind of modify the actual on the ground because the principles of spacing, elevation range would fit no matter what the as built looked like. So that's where we were able to adapt pretty well. And this is a pretty extreme case where it looks completely different. I'll talk a little bit about the super tidal area and how we kind of planted that. Because again, we had 30 acres, but again, it doesn't matter if you have, uh, you know, 20 square feet of it, uh, a quarter acre of it. You know, there's a lot of principles that you can do for barren sand above your tide line that can vary depending on, again, your project goals. Do you want it to be vegetated? Do you want it to be open for horseshoe crab and shorebird utilization? But I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So environmental conditions, I think some of this, I'm not gonna harp on this too much, but again, you know, elevation, salinity, wind direction, intensity, salt spray. These are all these really key considerations that most people already have a good handle of that, you know, vegetation grows within certain ranges. Um, one thing I'll kind of hit on is that for low marsh and high marsh plants um, in the mid-Atlantic, there's a lot of research that's been done that really dictates that where in that tidal prism um, you plant really has a, a huge impact on the overall growth. 
And for, um, for sustainability of marshes, that has a key consideration in that, again, like I said before, that the health of these plants really is dictated by how much it's inundated on a daily basis. And the more it's inundated, uh, the vegetation may, you know, start to die back and not be as vigorous like that, this uh, picture where it's kind of sparse, where, you know, a healthy stand of alterniflora, like the picture up here, may be very dense. Now, this can also lead, there's, I'm not going to really get into it, but, you know, nutrients is a key part in this. This area, if it's a eutrophied system with a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen, you may have a lot of above ground biomass, but the below ground biomass is basically, um, really reduced because of the excess nutrients. So this is not a sustainable stand. It looks pretty, but it's not really sustainable. Um, that's kind of a, a separate discussion that there's a lot of research on that um, is kind of one of those things if you really want to dig into. But how this really plays into it is that um, here's an example of some research I did in Delaware, where basically, you know, the bottom axis here is basically elevation relative to mean high water. Um, and these, this bar chart with the curve basically is showing the amount of below ground biomass, the amount of roots that these plants are putting into the, into the soil below. And again, the more it puts down, the more it helps to kind of basically build the marsh from the bottom up. So basically, this is saying that you want to be above high mark, be above mean high water, which is at zero. So there's a range, which we call the Goldilocks, where, you know, you're from zero to maybe about 15 or 20 uh, centimeters above mean high water to really optimize that growth. And the way, you know, how that fits in with what we're talking about here with even like, uh, you know, living shoreline stuff is that you really want to not think about just current conditions, but future conditions. So with sea level rise, changes in the tide prism, you want to build in a little bit of that where maybe you're planting your Spartan alterniflora at the upper end of its growth range, knowing that over time that um, as sea level rise goes up, it's going to be able to kind of be in an optimal growth range for longer rather than just planting at mean high water and then five years from now it's really struggling because it's already falling below that mean high water line and uh, you know the health and vigor of the plant is really going down as it's inundated more. This principle has a lot to play with um, you know patents as well so I think including sea level rise into your kind of distribution of plantings is a key consideration for you know especially your project goal of is this living shoreline going to be functional for 20 years? Are you looking just for a 10-year lifespan? Longer lifespans, you really need to consider sea level rise and how vegetation is going to basically uh, evolve with the evolving tide prism. So here's an example again, like, you know, I think some of it was already shown, these zonations. Um, you know, these are kind of those classic zonation ideas of, you know, low marsh, high marsh. Um, in a very thin ribbon of uh, area that you're working for, like a living shoreline, this zonation may hold true. Um, the larger your project is, this kind of goes out the window when you start incorporating things that we call microtopography, where you may have a larger footprint where, you know, it's a little bit harder for a bulldozer or people with shovels to grade it at a 1 to 50 zone. So what you may end up having is, little high areas, low areas, and actually, you know what, that's actually perfect because you really don't want to have a marsh that is just these classic line of zones where it transitions nicely. It's actually nice to have little high and low spots throughout the marsh where you may get little stands of Spartina patens, Spartina alterniflora, intermixing, growing together. That variability builds in resiliency, but for what like Brian's going to talk about, for wildlife utilization, that's actually a lot better to do rather than having these like classic zones. Um, again, you know, some of these things I think, which was already talked about, salt spray is a huge consideration. So when you're thinking about how to plant different things, um, it's the, some of these things on the bottom where it talks about stress and shelter. Um, that is kind of a key thing to think about with planting. So especially on dunes, you have the idea of stress on the fore dune that's facing basically your beach and your water. So those are the areas that have a lot more stress. So you're going to want to plant plants there that are more hardy. So that's where you're planting your American beach grass, which, you know, can take that stress. Well, on the back dune where it's sheltered, 
that's where you're going to plant less, you know, of, uh, you know, the hardy species like American beach grass. And that's where you can kind of build in your diversity of, you know, planting seaside goldenrod, doing the, you know, panicum brigadum, panicum amarum, different things like that to kind of build in the diversity. So I think having a sense of stress versus kind of shelter in your planting plan can kind of go a long way to, again, building in the diversity, but also not having to plant things and then come back two years later because certain species have died just because of, you know, where you've put it in with wind direction, salt spray, different factors like that. So installation methods. So these are some of the things I'm going to get more of. These are some of the kind of the things I really wanted to hit on in a presentation like this for people to think about um, what they should be looking at when they're doing installation of plantings. Because again, it's pretty easy to go into the literature and find uh, different aspects of growth range elevations, salinity tolerances, um, salt spray tolerances. But one of the things I like to hit on, because some of this is unless you really do this work, you may not have a good sense of some of these kind of key considerations. So for plugs, I'm going to kind of talk about a couple of different things. Um, you know, investigate or visit nurseries, um, planting mediums, uh, acclimating the plants to salinity prior to arriving to the site, keep plants appropriately hydrated, fertilizing, uh, planting depth and genotypes. All right, so um, the reason I say investigate or visit plantings or nurseries. So if you are going to be planting um, a significant amount of, of, you know, plants or plugs like this, it's maybe worth visiting the, the nursery. Because again, it's one thing if you're just getting 100 plugs and, you know, you, you could probably do okay. But if you're buying hundreds of thousands or even tens of thousands of plugs, you know, that's a lot of money that's going to go into this. So it's really worth your time to go to the nursery, you know, or, or the several nurseries around the area. Go visit them, investigate, look at their greenhouses, and use that to help determine what's the best bet. Because sometimes people kind of center more on, well, what's my price per plug and just cost only. Sometimes the person with the lowest cost may have issues. So the one on the left, you can see this greenhouse, um, they have a sprinkler system, they have all the plants are good, there's little plugs coming up, They're, they look real nice and pretty. So that's a good growth operation. Again, it's sheltered from the conditions. The one on the right, not so much. So the reason why is that you can see it's kind of open to the environment, but you can see that all these plugs of Spartina have already senesced. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, they're going to kind of go into a second so basically they're already a year old. So when these get shipped out, they're going to be going on their second growth season, which maybe it's a more robust, robust plug. But one of the things you have to consider is in that bottom one, you can see um, a bloom of algae. So sometimes you can get different uh, fungus and bacteria that start um, in, you know, kind of invading the greenhouse areas, especially when the plants are this dense, and you can get uh, – leaf scorch on alternaflora. So when you get them to the site the next year, they're senesced like this. You don't think anything of it, but when they start growing, you'll know that a lot of them start dying because of this. Another consideration is that the plugs on the left that are in their first growing season, when you go to pl uh, plant them, those will pop out of those little plastic pans real easy. The ones on the right, the roots have already grown through the pan. So pulling them out is going to be hard. So you either have to cut the roots, which is not necessarily a bad thing for plants, but, you know, so they're really grown into each other. So it makes it a little bit messier. And if you're trying to plant 20,000 plugs, the ones on the right are going to make it a lot harder to do. It's going to take a lot longer. Um, so this is an example of how plants are kind of like plugs like this are brought to the site. So you know, especially uh, for this project, these are all uh, Spartina patents. We were ordering, you know, roughly 150,000 plugs. So this is how they come. You may look at that and be like, oh, my God, this is terrible. No, that's kind of normal. But this only holds true is if they threw that they were in their greenhouse yesterday, they've been hydrated, they brought them to the site this morning, and they're still hydrated. As soon as these plugs start drying out, you're going to have issues. So when they come to the site like this, this made this is this is perfectly acceptable to me. I have no problem with that. And again, this is they're planting these in April, so you can see well April May. So you can still see some of uh, some dead growth and then the new growth. So that's a good thing sometimes where you can actually see 
you know, when you're planting in March and nothing's come up, so you're not really sure what's live, what's dead. So sometimes delaying your planting just a little bit can help to make sure you have actual live plugs going in the ground. Um, you know, a key thing that I like is so when you have big planting projects is temporary nurseries. So right here, they were going to be doing uh, planting of about 500,000 Spartina plugs along the shoreline um, uh, all along Prime Hook. So again, they're not going to be able to put them all in one day. So what they did is these temporary nurseries where they stockpile them all in the tide prism. So over the next couple of days while they're working, they're actually getting inundated with salt water. And one of the things this also does is help them to acclimate to the environment. So a lot of times in nurseries uh, with Alterna flora, even Peyton's, they'll grow them in fresh water. And good nurseries over time will start to try to introduce a little bit of salt into them to kind of acclimate them. But this is another way to kind of, before you put them in the ground where the ground's a little bit more hypersaline than the tide water, putting them like this and allowing them to kind of acclimate to the, the salinity of the site can help before you kind of put them in the ground. Now, so here's an example of how you would, so this is a, a big sand area that we're planting part, uh, Spartina patent plugs. And one of the key ways to do that is with a drill. You know, some people you can use dibble bars, but if you're doing a lot, I like doing drill bits, a, a drill. So basically it's a, you know, landscaping drill. You uh, get a, a two, just over a two inch bit to, that's a little bit wider than the diameter of the plug. And you basically drill a hole and you drop a plug in like the bottom left. And then you heal them in. The one reason I like doing this is that if you use a dibble bar for plugs, when you jam it in, you're kind of really jamming in the um, roots. And sometimes you can J the roots upwards. So a lot of the roots are kind of going upwards depending on what species, especially shrubs, uh, little trees. But also for the plugs, you want the roots to kind of have a nice um, aerated area around it for the roots to kind of easily start growing. You don't want to kind of pack them in. So that's a key consideration. And again, drilling makes it go very quickly. It can become a quick operation. Um, and this also works in mud. So here's a really muddy area that they're doing the same thing. They're drilling, dropping plugs in and healing them in. And again, those footprints, you may say, oh my God, I'm destroying the site, but not necessarily. That'll, you know, again, in an area like this where you have a lot of suspended mud, it's not a big deal. It kind of uh, covers over pretty quickly. So the drilling works in any environment. And the mud actually may work a little bit better because you really get good contact of the roots to the mud wall. It works really well. So uh, a key thing too, um, you know, so is if you're planting in a sandy environment, I highly recommend um, doing fertilization. Uh, you know, especially for marsh plants like this, you probably want to do a very balanced, like 10, 10, 10, uh, slow release fertilizer, like a granule. There's little um, things you can buy that kind of shoots like a tablespoon at a time into the hole perfectly. The reason I do that is that first growing season, you really want to be able to have the plant to kind of build up and have those nutrients available for growth. Now, in a sandy environment, it's usually pretty depauperate of nutrients. So you really want to give it an edge. And then over time, as organic material starts to accumulate, you start to get some accumulation of nutrients, it kind of works. And this even works in like, again, even the inland bays where you have a high level of nutrients in the water, um, you still probably want to kind of put in some uh, nutrients in the, in the, in the holes. Um, so one of the things though that I don't like about this picture is you can see that there's a little, uh, they didn't fill in the, the plants very well. You can see in some of them, are covered up and it's just a little tuft. Other ones, it's almost like the plants on its side and they didn't uh, cover them up very well. So a key thing when you're doing this is especially if you're doing volunteers or having a company doing it, walking the site constantly as they're doing it, inspecting the work. If you don't like what they're doing, tell them. Say, hey, can you replant all these or I want this like that, I don't want them like this. Key thing, if you're paying them or volunteers are working for you, really investigate everything that's happening. You're, it's going to go a long way. So, and a key thing that we had in one of our projects is that, uh, see how deep they put these plugs? You can see there's almost two inches of sand on top of the root. Um, and one of the things that we noticed is all these plants were starting to die. 
And once we investigated in these areas, they planted them too deep. So basically that root ball is sitting in the kind of groundwater that's underneath of the sand area. So the roots are never drying out enough. So basically being constantly inundated, the root uh, caused all this patents to die. So again, the plugs are being planted too deep. So again, investigating, looking how deep they're planting, how they're healing them in, key, key points. And so another thing that they were doing on this site, uh, you can see on the right-handed picture, there's plugs sitting everywhere. So this planting crew started getting a little sloppy because they had to put in a lot of plugs. So there's plugs just sitting everywhere, you know? And again, if you've paid for these plugs, um, you know, you want them in the ground. So these are just ones sitting on the ground and some of them can be you know, picked up and reused, but some of them, like this one on the left, um, it's kind of hard to see, but it's all the roots are desiccated. They're all dried out. All the little root tips are dried out. So this one is dead. It's not going to be recovered. So I think that's a key thing where I think a, a nice point that good um, nurseries will give you a tolerance. So when they're delivering, let's say, uh, 5,000 plants to the site, they may give you 5,100 because they know there's going to be some plugs missing, some plugs dead. Those are the things that actually go a long way because um, they know that there's a realism of like, hey, I'm going to have a couple plugs missing in, in, in some of these trays. If they're giving you exactly 5,000, I would be, I would kind of keep a tally because again, you're going to have some dead, you're going to have some plugs missing. That's kind of the nature of it, but kind of keep that in mind. Um, so, and again, here's an example of these two plugs were put in at the same time. The one on the bottom left was put in a little too deep, like I said. The one on the top right was put in at the right elevation and look at the amount of roots that are coming out. The bottom left, there's no roots kind of advancing out in the sediment because the plant's basically slowly dying. The one on the top right, you can see new, new shoots coming out. You can see roots that are, the rhizomes are already shooting out. And this was basically after about, uh, about a month, not even, maybe three weeks. So again, if you plant in the right conditions, man, it'll take off. So uh, a key thing for planting in these areas is this. So you can see all these nice Spartan alternative floor plugs in there. And in the, four, the kind of the background, you can see a fence. That fence is twofold. So um, that helps to keep the geese off the site. Um, in the mid-Atlantic, we have uh, snow geese and Canada geese. Uh, Canada geese like to come in and graze the top vegetation, especially new growth. Snow geese like to come in and rip the plants up and eat the roots. So these little fences on the front end help to prevent the geese from basically swimming up to the site. And this is a key thing when you have areas where it's like a thin project area. So a lot of the living shoreland projects where if you have geese that can swim up to it. Larger projects where they can actually land in it, you may have to have fences kind of scattered throughout it. Um, so Another thing that these fences do for areas where you have nutrient issues, especially inland bays, um, well, here's another example of that fencing. You can see that as the area is getting inundated, um, the fence is right there, kind of helping to stabilize it. And again, the fence is temporary. It's like you really just want it there for that first growing season. And then in the winter, you'll probably pull it out before you get ice rafting and winter storms, which will rip it out for you anyway. And you don't want that landing somewhere else or having to clean that trash up. But one of the things that this fence really has a key part in is um, in the inland bays and a lot of areas where you have macroalgae that grows or a lot of detritus in the water column or racks, it helps to collect on it. You can see on the fence there, there's a lot of stuff collecting on it. Um, and that's that can be a key thing because where you don't have that, um, if you get macroalgae sitting on top like this, it kills the plants out. So again, here's an area where you don't have the macroalgae, it's growing perfect. Uh, in sandy areas, here's a dune area. So again, when I was talking about the four dune on the right-hand side is American beach grass. Uh, on the left here is some American beach grass, but you can barely see it. There's little lines where Panicum virgatum is coming up. We seeded Panicum virgatum in between the rows that the American beach grass initially will stabilize it. But once the panic grass comes up, that actually takes over and does a lot better. So again, mixing it up with seeding and planting like this, you can see them coming up like that. And that's just a little seeder that you can do that kind of heals it into the sand. You know, we've done a lot of things where don't be afraid to kind of use shrubs. 
um, like was mentioned previously. So here's some sandy overwash areas where we don't want to just plant grasses. We were putting a lot of different shrubs like we're already outlined. And again, these sandy areas, if you put it in early in the season, they will get enough um, moisture to kind of perpetuate. But again, for us, it's a salt spray area. So we're putting in red chokeberry, black chokeberry, bayberry, different things that can take that salt spray. But for us, we're looking to stabilize the area, but also for bird habitat, because these a lot of these shrubs are, are berry forming, so it's great for the birds. We also put in a lot of things that um, are great early season and late season pollinators for monarch butterflies. So again, we try to incorporate multiple benefits into the project areas. Um, seeding, I'll quickly go through. Um, Seeding can be a key thing. Um, it's very finicky. There's a lot of prep that goes in it, but the method of seeding can be kind of make it a little bit more cost effective. Um, so you can, with like Spartan alterniflora, um, it needs to be cold stratified and kept in water, where a lot of other ones can be dried, so it's easier. So for Spartan alterniflora, if you can get that seed from either some of these places or collect it yourself, you can just have it in a bucket, mix it with either some sand or a uh, uh, kind of a carrier seed, something like a, an oat or something like that, you can hand seed it onto these mud flats like this. It can be that simple with seeding, especially mud. If you have mud or organic material where you can get the good seed contact, you can do it. And sand, you cannot do this like this. So here's an example we did with that method 2015, 2016, and then 2017. So some of this is that reinforcement of the more plants you have in the system, more seed is naturally pre being produced. Once it stabilizes, you get rhizomal activity, but a lot of it's jump starting. So that big whole area in two years um, was filled in. So sometimes when people are talking about, and this goes towards planting plugs of, oh, you need to plant them 24 inches on center. Kind of depends. If, if your goal is to kind of have it vegetated in several years, you can put them 48 inches on center and then it'll fill itself in. So don't sometimes waste the time to kind of put too many plugs in. Um, so in that back barrier that I talked about before, that 30 acres is kind of the gray area, that was kind of an open area uh, in the upper right picture like that. It's kind of sandy. So one of the things we did, we broadcast seeded a mix of Panicum amarum, Panicum brigatum, um, broadcast it out, and then use a cold packer to actually heal it into the sand. And you can see how by the bottom uh, right picture, it came up. So in sand, if you are going to seed, you have to find a way to basically till it under the sand, but you don't want to do too deep because it won't come up. But again, the, on the Panicum Mar and Panicum Brigatum, we did go out and fertilize it because it's it's depauperative nutrients. So you have to kind of keep those things in mind. One of the other things we did is um, we had a lot of mud flats that we needed to seed. So I think this is, uh, again, that idea of seeding. We actually put um, Spartan alternative floor seed, mixed it with uh, a, a native carrier seed, um, and basically used uh, planes to broadcast seed. Again, it's the same process they do for cover crop on fields. You can do that on project areas. And again, it can be hand seeders. It can be a plane if you have like big areas. So you can be creative in some of this. Um, I think that's a key piece for this. And of course, when you have vegetation growing up, so here's where we have the seeding coming up. Both of these, um, our, our natural Canada geese came and, and had a good old time with it, of course. Um, take home points, greater diversity, greater resiliency. Uh, does not, design does not equal the final product. So really keep that in mind, being adaptable to this. Um, you should always be designing for changing environment. Get the best contractors that suit your goals. And there are a lot of partners who can help with this. The other thing, uh, another key take home point is that when you're doing these planting plans, always kind of uh, mix, um, you don't have like straight lines of alterniflora and it grades right into patents. Have a couple lines where you're mixing species because again, that microtopography, um, wherever the tide lines kind of fall out, that's when you'll be able to kind of, um, you'll kind of building in that variability. So depending on how it works out, you'll always have something some type of vegetation that'll kind of succeed. So, all right, that's all I got. All right, uh, hi everyone. My name's Ashley Tabidian, and I'm an environmental scientist with the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. 
Today I'm going to talk to you guys about creating habitats for mollusca and bivalve shellfish, uh, more specifically oysters. I'll talk about it mostly from a restoration point of view, but I will finish up talking about the um, shellfish aquaculture that we have going on here in Delaware. When you say shellfish, most people automatically assume you're talking about crabs, but today we're going to be talking about molluscan bivalve shellfish. These are animals that belong to the mollusca phylum and the class bivalvia. They're named for their mollusk-like shells and their two-valved bodies. There are actually over 15,000 species of them, which includes clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops. All of these animals are aquatic in nature, and about 80% of them um, are marine. Uh, when you look at them, they have laterally compressed bodies that are enclosed by a shell consistent of two hinged parts. They force water through their mantle cavity, allowing them to swim, burrow, and attach to other objects, which is how they move around. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we deal with their reproduction. So first, we're going to talk about bivalves that we have here in Delaware. Delaware has four primary bivalve shellfish. The most popular one that we have is the eastern oyster on the top. These are harvested commercially, but in Delaware cannot be harvested recreationally. We also have the hard clams, um, which are only harvested recreationally, oh, which are harvested recreationally and commercially, I'm sorry. Then we have the razor clams, which are only harvested recreationally. Lastly, we have lots of rib mussels, and they are typically not harvested at all. Uh, for human consumption, a lot of people think that they don't taste very good. For the sake of time, since these are our biggest product, I'm going and the animal we have the most of, I'm going to focus primarily on oysters so we can get a little bit more in depth about them um, and their behavior and habitat. However, considering there are more than 15,000 species of molluscan bivalves, um, they are not limited to those that I speak about today. Even though they are different species, due to them all belonging to the same phylum and class, they have very similar characteristics and attributes, meaning that most of the information today is relevant across the board. Oysters are a marine bivalve mollusk that have a rough, irregular shell that is closed by a single, strong adductal muscle. They're invertebrates that form an outer shell for protection, which we'll talk about in a minute. Oysters are omnivores and filter feeders, and a group of oysters is referred to as a colony, a bed, or a reef. Oysters begin to form their shells once they've found a substrate for them to latch onto, which we'll again discuss later during the reproductive cycle. The shells are made up mostly of calcium carbonate with trace amounts of other organic materials, such as manganese, iron, aluminum, sulfate, and magnesium. The shell is often an oval or pear shape that is very rigid. However, the shape can vary depending on what they attach to, and that doesn't impact the um, health of the animal. They generally have a whitish gray exterior color with a porcelain white interior. They use that strong adductor muscle to close their shells when they feel threatened. A great way to identify if an oyster is alive or not is whether or not they're able to fully close their shell when you squeeze them. If they remain open, they're no good. So a little bit into the anatomy of an oyster. So oysters uh, are a pretty complex animal um, that are filter feeders. They eat by pumping large volumes of water through their body. The beating of the cilia pumps water through the oyster's gills. Plankton, algae, and other particles that are nitrogen-containing compounds become trapped in the mucus of the gills. These particles are transported to the oyster's mouth and esophagus, and then to the stomach to be digested. Once all the nutrients are removed, the indigestible material is expelled as feces. They also produce something called pseudofeces. This is super important. This is unwanted material like silt that, oyster, that the oyster has chosen not to eat. It will accumulate next to the gills 
and then it is, it is expelled via a rapid opening and closing of the gills. When this happens, it resembles a cloud of smoke and it makes the water look very cloudy. This is actually an indication that the oysters are filtering and cleaning the water. Um, a little side note is that because oysters are filter feeders, it does make them a little more dangerous to eat if they're taken from dirty waters uh, because they can hold up to 100 times the concentration of the surrounding water. So next we're going to talk about the reproduction. While oysters do have determined male, female sexes, they are protandric, meaning that they change their sex one or more times over their lifetime. In the first year, they reproduce as males, releasing sperm. And as they mature to two to three years old, they, um, they become females, releasing eggs. This is because releasing eggs requires much more energy than sperm, which is why they have to wait for maturity. That way they can use that extra energy to growing and finding a home. As males start to release the sperm, other oysters filter that in and use it as a cue to release their own sperm or eggs. They also take environmental cues, reproducing when water temperatures are consistently 20 to 30 degrees Celsius or 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit with a salinity over 10 parts per thousand. This is super important because if your environment doesn't meet these standards, the oysters or the shellfish will not be able to reproduce. The eggs meet the sperm and fertilize in the water colony. The fertilized eggs use the water currents to drift away from the spawning grounds and continue to undergo cell division. After about two weeks in this stage, the larvae begin forming a foot, which helps them move across the bottom. At this point, they begin looking for a hard substrate, and when they find it, they attach themselves by secreting a glue-like material. Here, the larvae undergo a complete metamorphosis of internal anatomy and become spat. The spat puts all of their energy into shell growth, able to grow about an inch a year until they reach maturity and start reproducing. An interesting fact is that a single female oyster can produce up to 100 million eggs annually. So now we ask ourselves, can a suitable habitat be made for oysters? The answer is yes. You're either able to identify an area that is suitable for oysters or you're able to do habitat engineering. First, it is important to know the environment that you are working in. Um, also, just to let you know, there is a copy of this flowchart in the Dropbox option where it's a little bigger and a little more um, easy to read. So uh, first, you need to know if your environment is within that 10 to 35 part per thousand saline. If it does not fall within this range, it is not a suitable habitat. Um, usually in tidal waters, you can't supplement that, so it's just out of the question right away. Next, it is important that there is an inundation time greater than 50%, meaning that the area will be flooded and covered, uh, covering the oysters more than half the time. Again, if it does not fall within this range and cannot be adjusted, this isn't a suitable habitat for these oysters. Is the hydronomic energy too high? And if so, is there an adjustment possible? This is a great step to consult an expert if you are unsure, because it is very important in the survival of the oysters. Next, we move out of the um, hydrosphere and we're moving into uh, engineering steps that impact the lithosphere. So first, you need to know, is there a hard substrate available for them to attach onto? In addition, is there sediment available for them to burrow into? If the answer is no, are you able to provide that with an artificial reef and or supplementing sedimentation on the bottom? It is also to make, uh, important to make sure that the total suspended solids concentration is not too high. This is important because it impacts their food source. If the um, FFCs are too high, it'll prevent phytoplankton from growing, which is an important part in the early stages of the larvae. Um, next, are there too many predators, both for oysters themselves and for their food sources? Will there be an out competition for food? If you're unsure about any of these, it's um, a good idea to consult an ecologist. Lastly, are there other shellfish, shellfish reefs around it? If so, how close? How healthy is that reef? And is there a risk of biosecurity, like diseases spreading 
If you're able to meet all of these standards or adjust for them, you have a potential site for a suitable shellfish reef. It is good to also remember that if you're working in areas that have a natural high recruitment level, it will, mean, it will lead to a much higher chances of success for some self-sustaining projects. So if you're working in areas that could already host a healthy shellfish reef and it just needs a little bit of help um, to move along, that's going to be your best bet. So what services would actually be provided by adding these oysters to this environment? It seems that the list of ecological benefits from oysters is almost endless. To name a few, oysters are a keystone species. This means that relative to their abundance, they have a disproportionately large effect on their natural habitat. Keystone species are integral to their specific ecosystem and their role is deemed vital if they were to be removed the ecosystem would change drastically, specifically with oysters because of how they filter the water and improve the water quality. They are also considered ecosystem engineers. This means that they provide services for other animals in the area. As an ecosystem engineer, they are responsible for maintaining the health and stability of the environment. Filter feeders are considered ecosystem engineers because they alter turbidity and light penetration, controlling the depth at which photosynthesis can occur. When it comes to designing a habitat for oysters or molluscan bivalve shellfish, the flow chart that we just went over are really the standards that you need to have a good home for them. Otherwise, everything that you're gonna get out of putting oysters there is going to be um, impacting the environment for other species to come in. Perhaps an oyster's biggest claim to fame is its ability to filter water. A healthy adult can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day, which equals out to be about 1.3 gallons an hour. And a healthy reef system can filter over 24 million gallons a day. This equates 36 Olympic-sized swimming pools. They filter sediment and nitrogen ammonia rich pollutants out of the water and deposit them in sacks on the bottom, which later get utilized as food sources for other animals. The ecological benefits don't end there. Wave energy is notorious for erosion, flooding, and property damage. Healthy oyster reefs can absorb as much as 76 to 93% of wave energy, which helps protect all living shorelines. Additionally, bivalve reefs are epibenthic, meaning they create spatially and topographically complex habitat. This available habitat creates these neighborhood communities that boost biodiversity in the area, resulting in a healthier ecosystem all around. Um, the biodiversity will attract other larger fish, which can also be extremely good for the ecosystem. Next, we have some economic benefits. The oyster's ability to filter water is both ecologically and economically beneficial. Healthy water bodies, specifically beaches, will attract more tourists and visitors. This in turn will boost the local economy. The attraction can often lead to more funding for restoration or conservation projects as well. Oysters have, have been a part of the Delaware community for centuries. Up until the mid 50s through the late 90s, where two different diseases called a drastic, caused a drastic decline in oyster populations all throughout Delaware. However, populations are reestablishing, and in addition with aquaculture, oysters are again a big part of the food market in, here in Delaware, both recreationally and commercially. Due to, due to demand, oysters create jobs, those farming, farming and harvesting through aquaculture those shipping and packing, conservationalists uh, working on reestablishing um, reefs. Uh, they are also used as a product in feedstuff for other livestock, which uh, can be very important. They can be used, uh, molluscan bivalve shellfish can be used to raise fish in aquaculture, um, which is very big right now. Byproducts have their own market. Example, you get pearls from the oyster, crush and run from clam shells, um, since these reefs have such biodiversity, they create something that we call ecotourism. So what effects will the oysters have on an existing ecological system? 
First, it's super important to be very aware of both of the ecosystem that you're working in and what you want your desired outcome to be. It's unlikely that creating an oyster reef will have a negative impact on the surrounding ecosystem. So it's more of gauging what oysters and their, what oysters can provide for you and the positive impacts they're going to have. This is why they're classified as ecosystem engineers and a keystone species. Oysters can prevent, provide shelter for crabs, snails, and they also can provide a nursery habitat for juvenile fish. Like I said earlier, they reduce wave energy, which helps protect shorelines. They also can provide a surface for other organisms to grow on. This includes other oysters and molluscan bivalve shellfish, so you need some to grow some. They provide a feeding ground for larger fish because they attract so many other species. They provide a rich nutrient source for seafloor animals through depositing those uh, uh, sacs that we spoke about earlier, um, the waste material from their filter feeding. They do denitrification, which removes excess nutrients from the waterway. They also, through clearing out the water column, allow light to penetrate further down, which allows other phytoplankton to grow and can also help in seagrass recovery. And lastly, they stabilize the substrate. This reduces the resuspension of fine sediment, which improves the water quality and will reduce the amount of total suspended solids in the water. Each of these individual side effects of having oysters can be pulled together to make for a much healthier, happier, and more sustainable ecosystem. So next, what is needed to establish a reef? These points are going to be very unique based on where you are located, the state that you're working in, um, and it's a good idea to reach out to local specialists and policy writers and ecologists with any questions or concerns that you may have. First, you need to consider the motivating factors behind this project. Are you looking to work with restoration or are you looking to do aquaculture? What issues are you trying to address and what do you want the outcome to be? Once you've um, contemplated these questions, you want to develop a very clear plan and workflow on paper. Reference existing ecosystem models if necessary. Use the resources that are out there for you. I've added a few links um, to two restoration project guidelines at the end of this presentation, along with um, Delaware's links, which we'll get to in a moment. The things you want to consider in this plan are location. Are there going to be any threats to consider? Predators, environmental impacts or weather events, um, extreme tidal changes where you will not get that 50, greater than 50% inundation. Um, also, uh, people, are there going to be any impacts from people, whether it's building up in the area where there's a lot of runoff going into the water, uh, lots of boating that could damage the reef? Will there be too much harvesting recreationally that they won't be able to survive? What is the water quality like in that area, and can we improve it? Next, you'll want to think about your restoration design. What is needed to improve the ecosystem? Will you need to provide an artificial reef, supplement the se sediment? Will you need to obtain and place the oyster feeds? That then takes us into monitoring. Who will conduct this monitoring? What will you be monitoring? And what methods will be used? Will you need to get technology? For example, will you just monitor growth? Or will you also monitor the water quality parameters? to see if it's improving, and human activity. Will you do this by just looking, or will you have different meters to measure oxygen, ammonia, nitrate, turbidity? Financing. Where will the funding come from? What is required to receive this funding? That takes you into stakeholder support. What resources will they provide, and what aid will they provide? Lastly, you want to determine your measure of success. And this goes back to what is your desired outcome and at what point will you deem it successful? Will this be measured on the percent of growth, the percent of water quality improvement, whether or not you're seeing new species come in, um, biodiversity, seagrass growth? Those are all things that you need to come up with in your plan. And lastly, we'll talk about what are the costs, risks, and uncertainties for introducing these ecosystem engineers. There always runs a risk when you impact an ecosystem by adding or removing something. 
The potential issues that may rise are, again, very specific to where you will be working in. But some major issues we can talk about are, first, biosecurity. Will it attract invasive species, diseases, or pathogens that may get introduced by the oyster seed? If so, is this able to be spread to other species? And what impact will it have on the overall ecosystem? You also want to come up with some ideas on what you can do to prevent any issues with biosecurity. Um, that is what we had a big issue with uh, diseases and pathogens between the 50s and 90s that completely destroyed our entire oyster habitat throughout the state. That is something that you really want to avoid, especially with shellfish aquaculture up and growing right now. Is there a market available? First, if you're producing oysters for a market, you need to make sure there is a demand for them. If you are not producing oysters for a market, but you need to seed your reef, you do need to make sure that there is a safe market to purchase these oyster seeds from that will not compromise the biosecurity or overall health. Um, it's, not really, it's not recommended to plant live shellfish on reefs in prohibited waters unless they are a species that is not harvested for human consumption. You can, however, provide a substrate for natural fat to collect on. These waters are labeled prohibited because they are not clean. Therefore, any filter feeders harvested from there would not be safe for human consumption, even if they were handled appropriately. To be successful, you really want to start planning early Communicate often with your team members, experts, and stakeholders, and do not be afraid to seek help from experienced shellfish networks. So along with reef restoration efforts in Delaware, there is also shellfish aquaculture. This is relatively new, and the first lease was issued in 2017. Additional leases have been added each year since. The first harvest of shellfish for market took place in 2018. In 2019, there were 51 acre, uh, acre leases in the inland bays for shellfish aquaculture. The majority of them, 44, being in the Rehoboth Bay, two in the Indian River Bay, and five in Little Astleman Bay. Of those 51 acres, there were 11 leases. 10 were for commercial production, and one was for scientific and research purposes. Um, we have leases available for lands within our defined shellfish aquaculture development areas, or what we call SADAs. These are areas that have been deemed safe to grow and harvest shellfish with the intent of human consumption. Since oysters are for filter feeders, we eat, and we eat them raw, we eat much of what they filter out so that they can filter from dirty water. It can make them unsafe for us. The shellfish program works on monitoring the water quality and updating designated areas as necessary along with monitoring the steps from harvesting to market to ensure the safety of the con consumers. However, the shellfish over um, through Denrex Fish and Wildlife is how you're able to lease land inside or outside of these sodas. You are able to lease land outside of the designated areas in the Inland Bay's nursery, but it does require a special application. The contact for all of this is Zena Hentz over at Denrex Fish and Wildlife. And this is their phone number. Next, um, these are just some resources that might be helpful. The first two are, uh, the first one is some restoration guidelines for shellfish reefs put out by the National Conservatory, and it's a great uh, read if this is something you're interested in. Next is the design and monitoring of shellfish restoration projects, which again is, um, so it's, it's by NOAA, and it's a nice outline of some things you'd need to consider. Those I referenced throughout this entire presentation. The next one is the Delaware Shellfish Program, which is what I work on, and we monitor the health of the environment. And lastly is Delaware Shellfish Aquaculture through Fish and Wildlife, uh, which is where you will actually get your leases and they handle that side of it. And then I did see that there was a question. Yep, there is um, one question, Ashley, if you can't answer this, I think I can. Um, so Jake asks, can you speak to planting rib mussels for a marsh restoration project, for example? What are strategies for planting fat? What are strategies to improve natural recruitment? So the rib mussel one, I can tell you, will be answered um, not tomorrow, but Thursday. 
Um, there are a couple of projects for which the partnership with the Delaware Estuary has done such things. Um, and Josh Moody will be able to answer that question. But Ashley, I don't know if you want to get forward the um, strategies for planting fat and natural recruitment. Um, if that's something that will be addressed, I'll probably let him handle that. Um, okay. Uh, just because he'll probably do a better job um, if he's already prepared for it than me. Um, as far as <laughs> any data on long-term impacts of shellfish restoration monitoring, that is actually um, not really my field of expertise, so I'm sorry that I can't answer that right now. However, I'm happy to look into that for you, and um, if you want to send me your email, I can send you whatever I'm able to find. And Ashley, if you send me that information too, I can um, post that for people to, to use. Okay, great. I'll get that so, to you as well. That's not a problem. So one of the reasons we added this presentation in is because a few years back we realized that uh, attendees to our workshops really didn't know how oysters work. And if you want to create habitat for an oyster, you need to know how they function, um, especially if one of your goals for a living shoreline project is water quality. Uh, Josh Moody from the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary will be addressing um, a project they created to specifically target water quality improvements through the use of oysters. So keep in mind everything she said as we move to the next day. Um, if you have any questions, keep them rolling in. I'm going to go ahead and make Brian a presenter so we can keep a rolling. And then, Brian, whenever you're ready, you can start sharing your presentation. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. And can you see the presentation? Yep, it's up and it's only a single screen, so you're good to go. All right, great, perfect. Um, yeah, my name is Brian Marsh. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and our coastal program, and specifically our Delaware Bay Estuary Project Office. And we do conservation projects throughout the Delaware River watershed, but we're most focused on the Bay Area and most focused on uh, shorebirds and beach habitat, and then tidal marsh birds and salt marsh. And today, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the food webs along the beaches and the salt marshes where you might be considering living shoreline projects. And this edge area, where you're doing these projects, uh, it has a food web that's very much connected to the open water and the uplands or the bordering wetlands. And you'll often see some of the greatest productivity and diversity right along this edge. Uh, for example, in this picture, you're going to see a lot more diversity and productivity right where that line is than you would in the open water or up on the marsh platform. And the exact extent of this edge area, it's going to vary by site, but in a situation like this, it's only going to go in maybe two or three meters at most into the vegetation. And a little general info about uh, food webs. Food webs are largely about feeding relationships between organisms, which mean they're about the movement of things, like movement of energy, movement of nutrients, movement of carbon. And that's an important thing to, to keep in mind when we're, we're talking about what's going on in this area. And it, when we talk about this edge, it's an example of an ecotone. And this is a, a word from ecology. And ecotones are these transitional areas between two environments. So they have this unique combination of characteristics of both of the environments. And they're very important connecting points uh, for the movement of the energy, nutrients, and, and carbon, and so on. And, and this transfer and movement are key things to think about when you're thinking about living shorelines and whether they're going to be successful uh, or appropriate for a particular site. And 
Today I'm going to speak really in, in general terms uh, about the food webs along the edge because, as you know, the shore varies so much over area and it varies so much over time. The edge is a really dynamic environment and so is the food web that's going to be present there. This picture, uh, it shows a great example of some nice natural edge. This little tidal creek um, and its bordering vegetation, it's going to offer a lot more to many kinds of organisms than the area off in the distance there in the open water or the area that's probably off to the left uh, that might be, you know, um, high marsh. There's a ton of structural diversity here. There's a lot of food. Um, there's a lot of cover. And there's a lot of nutrient turnover, all concentrated right in this one area where you might be considering a living shoreline project. And generally speaking, the, the edge that we're talking about, it's a tough environment because of all the factors that, that we've already heard about, you know, the, the salinity and the wave energy and so on. So you might not see as much diversity as you might in other ecotones, but, but you certainly will see more than you likely would out in the open water or up on the marsh platform, at least um, during some parts of the year. And uh, for our area, it's important to think about what's natural and what's natural is much more what you see at the right there uh, at South Bowers Beach uh, on Delaware Bay compared to the situation you have at Port Mahon there in the left position, the left uh, picture. Um, that kind of hardening is not a natural occurrence in Delaware Bay. We're generally dealing with mostly mostly a soft shoreline, uh, certainly with oyster reefs and uh, uh, other kinds of reefs as an, uh, an exception. But when you change from what you see on the right to what you see on the left, there's also going to be a lot of changes and dramatic changes to the food web. And here we have a a really simplified food web for Delaware Bay. Uh, the key thing to notice, as with any food web, is that there's a lot of connections. And then here you also want to notice that at the base of this food web, you have things like phytoplankton uh, and salt marsh plants and detritus. They are really important uh, bases to the food web that we have in this area. And now I want to go through some different examples of species uh, in the food web and uh, the living shoreline implications uh, of the, the presence of those species. And I'm just going to touch on a few different ones, and I'm focusing mostly on the brackish to, to marine area of the Delaware Bay area. And we might as well start small uh, with the plankton. Uh, these are the organisms that are largely dependent on on the currents and the tides for their movement. And there's two different kinds of plankton. There's uh, the phytoplankton and the zooplankton. The, the phytoplankton are those that can photosynthesize. Uh, so really importantly, they're bringing in a lot of energy and a lot of carbon into the system. And for our situation here in Delaware Bay, a lot of the phytoplankton are the microalgae and specifically the diatoms, like you see in the, the pictures there to the right. Those are all species that are, are quite common in our area. Okay, phytoplankton, it's produced on the marsh surface uh, or even up uh, in intertidal areas of the beach to some degree, but for the most part, it's being produced much more so out in the near shore waters. So, if you're thinking about a living shoreline or, or you're looking at it maybe a degraded shoreline site, that's sitting in an area between uh, an area that's a net consumer, that is the, the high marsh or, or the, the, the beach surface, the intertidal area of the beach, and a net producer, that is the near shore water. So a healthy edge, whether natural or uh, restored with a living shoreline, it needs to maintain that flow of phytoplankton back and forth across the edge. 
And now zooplankton, that other fraction of plankton, these are the, the plankton that are feeding on things. Um, they include many kinds of life, but a lot of them are small, uh, immature animals in Delaware Bay. But uh, a lot of them also are things like microscopic crustaceans, copepods. Uh, you see a picture of a copepod there on the right, are very common zooplankton in um, Delaware Bay. They're a major link in the food web, so they're consuming things like phytoplankton and detritus, and in turn becoming important food to uh, fish and, and uh, other organisms. Uh, in this picture here, you see an example of a zoea that's uh, an immature, in this particular situation, a bl immature blue crab. It's its larval form, and uh, there are important components of the zooplankton out in Delaware Bay as well. Zooplankton are a little more mobile than phytoplankton, but still, they're basically dependent on the currents and the tides. Uh, and so they're going to rely, and the things that feed on them are going to rely on the currents and the tides to bring them back and forth across the edge. And you should notice that maintaining this movement of, of organisms back and forth across the edge is gonna become a, a recurring theme here, an important uh, consideration for what you see along the edge and a living shoreline and um, how you design it. Okay, next, moving on to plants. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of kinds of plants along the shore. Um, but the species there that are present are really a big part of the food web. And uh, we've already heard this species mentioned several times this morning, uh, Spartina alterniflora, or Sporobolus alterniflorus, some name it. Um, this is a really important plant at a healthy low marsh edge. And these plants are contributing a lot uh, of structure uh, a lot of microhabitats and uh, along a salt, low salt marsh edge. Uh, and for the food web, they're important, but especially it's not so much their green tissue, like you see in the picture, it's the dead tissue that's more important to the food web. So when these plants die back, or for that matter, when Phragmites and other plants die back, those dead bits of plant leaf that detritus becomes very important to the base of the food web that we have here in uh, Delaware Bay. So a healthy amount of vegetation along the shoreline has a lot of implications uh, to the food web. And so this detritus, it's a really big part of the food web. Uh, and a lot of the detritus are these, these bits of broken down plant material, but there's also a lot of uh, dead uh, organic you know, uh, animal matter, but then also there's a lot living on the detritus. So there's a lot of bacteria and fungi and so on living on this. And in turn, all of this is then consumed by a diverse mix of organisms, uh, the mussels and the oysters and things that, that we've already heard about. And uh, like with phytoplankton, like with zooplankton, the detritus, for it to be such an important part of the food web, especially along the edge, it needs to freely move back and forth over that edge uh, so the various organisms uh, can consume it. And now uh, I'll talk a, I wanna talk a little more about the macroinvertebrates um, that you might see along the shore. A lot of the, the most characteristic animals that you see uh, in areas where you might consider a living shoreline project are some of these macroinvertebrates. And one of the more important, uh, but least obvious groups are the worms. And there's a lot of worms uh, living in and on the sediments you see along the edge, whether it's uh, a beach or a marsh edge. And they in turn become really important prey to a lot of different kinds of organisms. Uh, and the, the worm populations are changed drastically when you change the sediment along the shoreline. So whether it's a, a storm that's changing the sediment or whether it's um, a degraded shoreline changed by things that humans have done or whether you know, it, it's even a living shoreline, uh, 
there are going to be changes in the worm population. So uh, using as much native sediment uh, certainly is a helpful way to, to benefit the getting the worm populations reestablished. Another macroinvertebrate that's uh, a little more obvious is the eastern mud snail. And these are the small snails you may see uh, in large aggregations uh, in intertidal uh, muddy sediments. Uh, the little patches of mud flat that you see along a uh, salt marsh edge very likely will contain some of these mud snails. And these snails will lie on a layer of detritus and phytoplankton coming in with the tides. And then organisms like these also rely on the tides because the tides are what move their larvae out in the nearshore waters where those larvae then develop. And then the tides move the larvae back where they settle down and metamorphose into adults. So again, another species that's high, highly reliant on having uh, as much of an open edge as possible. Quickly, another uh, snail example that you will often see along the, the marsh edge is the marsh periwinkle. And like this mud snails, um, they're really important prey to a lot of different kinds of organisms. Uh, certainly things like terrapin are going to be feeding on these snails. Uh, the marsh periwinkle in particular likes to congregate around the base of alterniflora. And then not only that, it often likes to crawl up the alterniflora and it grazes on the surface of the leaves. And it doesn't so much graze on the, the tissue of the leaves as it's grazing on the fungi and so on that build up on the leaves. And, and in, in ways, it's also creating the situation that enhances the populations of that fungi because it's, it's damaging the plant tissue a little bit and in so doing, enhancing the, the, the fungus population on the leaves. Okay, uh, another great example of a common macrovertebrate uh, that you might see along the edge, and one that's already been mentioned, is, is the rib mussel. They usually are found at the base of alterniflora, and the, the mussels have planktonic larvae that are distributed along the edge by the tides and the currents. Uh, and then these larvae settle out and they become adults. And then the adults feed on the detritus, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and so on, that moves back and forth across the edge. You need a, a good alterniflora populations to get a good mussel populations. You need uh, that good connection with, uh, with the tides and the currents. And then ideally, you also already have some mussels established. Uh, the rib mussels always seem to like to, to congregate in areas where there's al already rib mussels. So uh, the more mussels you have, the easier it will be to get even more uh, rib mussels uh, getting established. Uh, blue crabs, uh, another good example of a macroinvertebrate that is concentrated right around the edge during parts of the year. It really needs this free access to go back and forth across the edge to forage uh, and to find cover. Uh, it's a very important predator in this area and uh, has a lot of influence on what other organisms are going to be present. Uh, the larval form of the crab, the zoea, they become a really important part of the zooplankton that's out in Delaware Bay. Uh, and then the, the tides and the currents, they bring the zooplankton or the uh, zoea back to the marsh edge where they're going to uh, settle down on the marsh surface and metamorphose into the adult form of the crab. Fiddler crabs, another really important crab along uh, the edge and incredibly abundant in areas. You can have hundreds per square meter. Uh, foraging on the phytoplankton and detritus on the surface, but then also being foraged on by a lot of different kinds of organisms. Um, they're re a really important link in the food web. Um, and they're, they're also very important because when you have, you just imagine hundreds of fiddler crabs in a square meter, but then you have all those fiddler crabs 
digging burrows, and some of these burrows go down a couple feet. So you can imagine how much aeration that means to the sediment and how much nutrient turnover that means of all these burrows uh, being there and being re-excavated uh, on, on a daily basis. They, they're going to need soft sediments generally. They really aren't going to be found anywhere where there's a lot of armoring. And uh, like all species I mentioned, uh, the fiddler crab needs that open edge because they need that their food coming in uh, with each tidal cycle. And then they also need the tidal cycles um, to take away uh, uh, their, their larvae uh, and then bring them back and allow them to settle on the marsh surface. Shrimp, another important macroinvertebrate along the edge. Um, it's really important, uh, although they maybe aren't as visible as some of these other uh, examples. Uh, shrimp are concentrated right around the edge, especially during high tides, and then they become a favorite prey for a lot of the fish that are moving into the edge to forage. And one more macroinvertebrate, and it's an iconic one for our area, it's a horseshoe crab. Horseshoe crabs, they really prefer the, these gentle sloping beaches and porous sediment, uh, and then they need access to these beaches. So you don't want to block their access. And if you're working in an area like this, you really need to think about the, the sediment size that's being reestablished. Horseshoe crabs, you may see them nesting in muddier sediments or, or pea sediments, but those eggs really most likely aren't going to um, actually develop in those areas. Okay, moving on to fish. Uh, most fish in Delaware Bay are somehow, to some degree, uh, connected to the edge. Uh, and exactly how that depends, you know, depends on the specific species, and not only the species, but the age class uh, of the species in the season. Uh, but these are really important organisms that you want to have in mind when you're you're thinking about the edge and living shoreline projects. Killifish are a good example of species that might be found right along the edge. Uh, there are important species in the food web as far as forage fish uh, to other species. And um, mummachog is probably the classic example that you hear about. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of killifish. Uh, there's about five species that are found in the middle of the bay, uh, more as you go uh, further up the estuary. Uh, Mummachogs are most likely going to be found in some of the muddy, muddier areas along the edge. Uh, they do go a little further back into the marsh than some of the species, and uh, they are feeding on the zooplankton and, and uh, other uh, stuff that's being brought back in and uh, forth with each tidal cycle. So they might be further back on the marsh, but they're relying on, on that uh, connection uh, to the tides. And another example of a killifish that you might have in your area, and that's the striped killifish. Um, it's another very common kind of fish along the edge, but it's going to be a little more often found in the areas where the, the sediments are more sandy, so along the beaches and in some of the sandier tidal creeks, you're going to see a lot of these uh, killifish. Okay, and then there's um, another example of a fish that uses the edge is the Atlantic silverside. And it's one of the most abundant fish in Delaware Bay area, the whole area, along with the bay anchovies and menhaden and other species that are at times are going to be dominant along the shore and in tidal creeks. Atlantic silversides are worth mentioning because in addition to, to food and cover along the edge that is so important for them and their value as a forage fish to other species, um, the edge is important to the Atlantic silver side because they have eggs that they're laying at high tide right along the marsh edge. And their eggs need to adhere to the vegetation and uh, develop partly above uh, the the, the tides uh, to avoid some of the predation from all the different species that would love to just feed on the eggs as they do on the adults. So having a vegetated shoreline is quite important to the, um, the Atlantic silversides. They're laying their eggs very often on a good, healthy, uh, low marsh edge consisting of uh, the Spartina alternate flora. Uh, 
And there are a lot of species of fish that use the edge just part of the year for part of their life cycle, and you know, such as the Atlantic croaker that you see pictured here. Um, this is a really important uh, function of this area to many species. Um, and so we call it a, a nursery habitat, uh, a, an area that's an important habitat to the juveniles of these species. And when we talk about the marsh in particular as a nursery habitat, you know, people look out over, out over a huge expanse of a marsh and think of all that as the, the important fish habitat and the nursery habitat for these species. But really, when we're talking about nursery habitat, we're talking right about along the edge here where the living shorelines are gonna go. Uh, that's the important nursery habitat where most of the juveniles of these species are gonna be concentrated. So something like a, you know, an unbroken sill along the edge of a marsh is going to have some drastic effects potentially on the, the juvenile populations of some of these fish species. And a lot of species just come in uh, as transients, foraging along the edge. Uh, they're maybe not quite as dependent upon it as some of the other species. So we just call them transient species. The, there's kind of a gray area between what is a, you know, a species, species using it as a nursery habitat or um, that are highly dependent on uh, the marsh edge. Uh, the American eel is a good example of a, a transient species that's coming in occasionally to forage. Uh, its population might not be entirely dependent on a healthy marsh edge, but it sure is going to benefit on the foraging opportunities provided by that, that healthy edge. And then you know, even some of the most uh, iconic predatory and game fish of the Bay Area are also tied to what happens at the edge. You know, bluefish, weak fish are, are classic examples of, of predatory fish in the Delaware Bay Area. And they may not be right in that edge, but they sure are foraging on the populations of other fish species uh, that are, are immediately dependent on the edge. And, and one uh, reptile that's especially worth mentioning is the diamondback terrapin. And the terrapin is a species that spends a lot of its time back and forth over the edge. They depend heavily on the area for forage and for cover, for hibernating sites. And then also they require the ability to get past the edge when they go up to their nesting sites in the summer. And those nesting sites are above the high tide line. So some uh, living shoreline projects could actually potentially interrupt this movement of the terrapins, but more likely it's, it's the other shoreline protection measures that have been put in place. A lot of the armoring and so on prevents the, the terrapins from getting up to their nesting sites. It sometimes replaces their nesting sites, the, the soft sediments that they need with riprap, or in many cases what happens is the terrapin Unfortunately, they're, they're just the right size to get caught in between some of the riprap that's used. So they get entrapped uh, and die, which is, um, becomes quite a, an impact on the population when the armoring is done over such a large scale as we see in some areas. Okay, and then one last big group of organisms to mention, it's the birds. Um, and I'd like to, you to have them in mind when you're considering living shoreline projects. And the first big uh, group of birds are the shorebirds. They're this group of similar birds that you might see around living shoreline projects, whether you're working along a marsh edge or along a beach. Uh, they're most concentrated in Delaware Bay in the spring as some of the populations migrate through as they head to Arctic nesting grounds. And a great example of these birds is the red knot that you see pictured on the left. Uh, this is a federally threatened species, so it's protected by the Endangered Species Act. It arrives here in May, and over the course of just a couple weeks, it nearly needs to double its weight. And it's mostly foraging on horseshoe crab eggs. So during this time in May, 
it really needs disturbance-free foraging. It needs to spend all of its time during the day when it has a chance to be feeding on these horseshoe crabs. So you really want to avoid disturbing these birds, uh, as well as some of the other species that are highly dependent on, on the Delaware Bay shoreline um, in May. Uh, it's best to avoid some of these areas from about May 1st to June 15th, because the populations uh, aren't all arriving at the same time. And just another thing, because they're, they're foraging so much on the horseshoe crab eggs, what's good for horseshoe crabs is generally good for uh, these shorebirds. And then moving on to another group of birds are the tidal marsh birds. And the clapper rail, which you've already heard mentioned today, that's a, it's a really good example of a kind of bird that's going to be foraging right along the marsh edge. They, rely heavily on this area, and they're going to be feeding on some of the, the species I've already mentioned, the mummachogs and the, the mud snails and the periwinkles and so on. And not only that, they're going to be nesting uh, right along the marsh edge, especially up uh, along some of the small tidal creeks. And they can be potentially nesting uh, throughout spring and then uh, early summer, and then you also don't want to, to disturb their young. So you might not be establishing a living shoreline up in one of these relatively healthy tidal creeks, but you might be needing to get through an area like this to get to a, a, a living shoreline site. So you have to be get, um, understanding that there, these birds might be around and might be nesting, and they're highly dependent on, on this habitat that you might be passing through or working in. So those are the marsh, tidal marsh birds, but then also uh, one more group that needs mentioning are the beach nesters. And they might not be the most common bird in the area where you're considering a living shoreline. They're mostly occurring in areas that are already protected. So places like uh, Cape Henlopen or uh, Prime Hook National Wildlife Refuge is where uh, they're most likely going to be found. But it's important to be aware of them and you don't want to pass through an area where these species are to get to one of your living shoreline sites. These species are really highly uh, vulnerable to disturbance. Uh, a small amount of disturbance is going to push them off their nests, and then their eggs or their chicks are going to become vulnerable to predation. So just a, another um, a kind of group of species to be considerate of when you're thinking about living shorelines. And so in summary, um, it's really important to be aware that right where you might be considering your living shoreline project, uh, there's this, this really important food web, an interesting food web. And maintaining a healthy, resilient shoreline, uh, whether it's you know, a completely natural shoreline or restored with living shoreline, it's important to, to maintain it for this food web. Uh, and a living shoreline can be a really a good way to, to help this food web. Uh, but be aware that even with a living shoreline, you might be making changes um, to the habitat. And it may take a few years before you get a completely natural food web reestablished. So that's all I have. And uh, now I can answer some questions if you have them. Thanks, Brian. Yeah.